on July 1992, Rolf Fuller had driven with his brother from Erberswald to Tutlingen in Germany to visit family. He hadn't slept well the previous night and was quite tired. Upon arriving, he joined his relatives on the balcony. It was a beautiful, warm summer night. The balcony faced some nearby wooded hills, and the sky was mostly clear. Eventually, everyone went inside. Rolf remained outside, relaxing. At around 10.30, he spotted what he thought was a star moving slowly. It began to grow in size. At first its color was white, then red and blue, then white again. When it had come to within a few thousand meters of him, Rolf recognized that it was a pyramid of light. It moved closer from an elevation of 45 degrees and remained stationary at 35 to 40 degrees. This lasted for two seconds. It looked as if it left glowing pyramids in its wake looking like a time exposure of a moving object. This pyramid object carried out circular movements with its base, which measured some 50 meters, while its pointed top remained stationary. Every two to three seconds, a flash illuminated the area underneath the pyramid. After a while, the pyramid backed away in an upright position, describing an S-shaped horizontal curve. It was now close to 1 a.m., the pyramid had seemed to reduce in steps, as if it were being, quote, swallowed up by a vertical wall. Rolf, for some reason, did not call for his seven family members to come out and watch what was unfolding in the sky. Instead, he just sat there, watching, transfixed. Rolf began to question if the light flashes he had seen were actually just lightning from a distant thunderstorm. He thought the whole thing was strange, but knew that there wasn't much he could do about it, so he brushed it off and went inside. The two brothers had planned to sleep at a family member's home, which was at the other end of the town, and so they hopped back into their car and journeyed the 20 minutes to the location. It was now around 2 a.m., July 25th. Both men were ready for sleep. The house had a bedroom, one with a large bed. The brothers each picked a side and crashed. Sometime after laying down to sleep, Rolf awoke to find himself in a completely different room. He looked around, trying to make sense of what was happening. The room, illuminated by reddish light, appeared to be about five meters in diameter. He then observed, standing in front of him, a small figure about four and a half feet tall. He was wearing a blue suit with a black belt and a dark blue peak cap. The figure's arms were long, as were its fingers. Rolf stared at the face. It was not human. To him, it looked like a, quote, rabbit without its ears. The creature had large and slanted, closely spaced dark eyes, a jutting chin, a small mouth, a very small nose, and apparently no ears. It also seemed to have stubbly hair sprinkled about its head and face. On the creature's suit, in a yellow field on one of the sleeves, Rolf could see a lettered symbol of some sort. Rolf, now frightened, reached out to grab the creature and begged to tell him what was happening. At that moment, Rolf felt his arms being grabbed by two even smaller creatures, both wearing grayish-brown coveralls. Rolf could sense that they were both very light, and he proceeded, almost in a panic state, to elbow the creature holding his left arm in the face. It immediately fell to the floor. A second creature grabbed at his right arm, and Rolf managed to lift both of them up with his right arm. He noticed that they were not grabbing him directly with their fingers, but rather they clamped their arms around his and crossed their fingers around an arm of theirs. He sensed that they were trying to move him to a medical couch. At least that's what Rolf thought it was when he saw it. He managed to break loose and ran and jumped over the couch. He proceeded to pick it up. It was also very light. 
and was contemplating throwing it at the creatures when the thought came into his mind. He won't be able to leave this place without their help. The prospect of remaining with these creatures frightened him, and he decided to place the couch back down. Rolf had accepted that this was an unwinnable situation. He stepped out from behind the couch and slowly walked up to the one he assumed was the leader, the one with the cap. By now, Rolf had surmised that this experience, the creatures, had something to do with the strange triangular object he had observed hours earlier. He spoke to the leader, referring to him at various times as Boss, Fat One, and Dicker, a derogatory German way of addressing a person. He asked what they wanted with him. The leader did not respond. The creature merely stood there staring at him. Rolf then poked the figure in the stomach with the back of his hand and asked him to, quote, say something. Upon doing this, one of the smaller creatures jumped on Rolf's back while the others grabbed at his arms. In the skirmish, Rolf kicked at the leader, causing his cap to fly off his head. The creature on Rolf's back then pressed its hand into his mouth. For some reason, this caused Rolf to rapidly lose consciousness. When he awoke, he was back in the darkened room with his brother. He sat upright in bed and looked around. He thought it was over, though as his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he could make out five figures standing near his bed, looking at him. It seems they were now in his room. The creatures pushed Rolf into a horizontal position on top of his brother, who appeared to be asleep. At this point, Rolf's perception went haywire. He could see the creatures in double. Another abductee, Betty Andreassen, also described seeing the beings in double in her case. Suddenly, this multiplicity of projections merged into a single one. And then that single entity seemed to just vanish. It was now early morning, the sun was coming up, and Rolf, still thinking the experience was happening, made an effort to protect his brother, who was eight years his junior, by throwing him off the bed onto the floor. When Rolf spun around to confront the figures, which he thought might still be in the room, he found that they were alone. His brother wondered why he had thrown him out of the bed. Rolf attempted to explain what had happened, but the brother did not believe him assuming that he was just hogging too much of the bed. Sometime later, with the room now lighted by the sun, both men fell back to sleep. Curiously, when he went to bed, prior to his being taken, Rolf claims that he was wearing only a t-shirt and some shorts, though aboard the craft he recalled being fully dressed, including pants, shoes, and a shirt. For this reason, Rolf wanted to find out more about what may or may not have transpired in that period of time that he could not remember. Professor H. Klaus Bick was asked by MUFON to conduct regressive hypnosis on Rolf, though it remains unclear if they ever followed through on this, as I could find no documentation of said regression session. Personally, I suspect that at some point after falling asleep, Rolf had been roused from his sleep by something outside possibly a noise or a light. He had gotten dressed and went outside to examine the disturbance whereupon he was taken, though this section of his memory was erased. It would explain why he thought he was wearing clothes. Were the entities in the process of undressing him and placing him back into his bed when Rolf came to? Was that done as a means of obfuscating the encounter, purposely confusing Rolf to make him wonder if he had merely been dreaming the whole thing? That said, it remains unclear why they elected to place him atop his brother, or how they were able to create doubles before morphing into the one. Maybe the beings were attempting to show Rolf what exactly they were capable of before departing. German researcher Illebrand von Ludwiger wrote of and presented along with various others the Fuller case for the 1993 MUFON Symposium. In German CNAP report number 226, the Rolf Fuller case was referenced as an example of a, quote, bystander witness abduction. This is a case in which a person merely observes a UFO only to find themselves visited or outright taken at a later time. 
In Rolf's case, it appears as though the creatures must have followed him to the other house and waited for the right moment, when he was at his most vulnerable, to pounce. It remains unclear if the beings chose him or if his observance of their craft that night drew their attention to him, which later resulted in their visitation. Another aspect the report touched on was the ability of the creatures to seemingly, quote, switch off the abductee. With Rolf, it seems the being merely needed to touch his mouth, at which point he lost consciousness, not unlike flipping a switch on a machine. Rolf Fuller's encounter remains one of the few that I'm aware of in which the abductee managed to physically assault the beings, and for that reason, it's fascinating. I'm always reminded of the Ricky D case, in which, while aboard the craft, he merely thought about punching the entity, at which point a voice in his mind told him, if you do what you're thinking about doing, the world as you know it will change forever. I sometimes wonder how many of the missing 411 cases involve people who actually fought back.